Welcome to the West Hearts College podcast series, The Industry in Isolation. Each week we'll be speaking to various professionals across the creative industries to answer student questions and to find out what the secret is to their success. Our guest today is Oliver Seymour Marsh, who is here to talk to us about his work as a voiceover actor, which has seen him lend his voice to a number of advertising campaigns for the likes of Coca-Cola, FIFA, and most recently, Quaker Oats. He's also a stage actor and musical theatre performer who's worked at the National Theatre and starred in the West End. Hello, Oliver Seymour Marsh. Hello there, Amelia Rendell. Hi, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Very well on this bright, bright spring morning. Thank you very much for agreeing to chat with us today about what you do. Um, A lot of our students are actually quite interested in voiceover work, so it's going to be a really exciting one for them to hear about. So, can you sum up what your job actually is for me? Of course. Uh, For the last 10 years, I have been a, a voiceover artist, which means that I get called into projects for all sorts of different companies, um, for games manufacturers, for corporate enterprises. And I sit in a booth in front of a microphone and make an awful lot of silly noises. And then if I'm very lucky, uh, people end up paying me for it. (laughs) Very nice, succinct answer there. Thank you. Um, So let's kind of rewind the clock, if you like. If we go back to the very beginning... How did you get into performing arts and voiceover in general? Well, I I have always enjoyed playing with my voice. And I think that's a, a very important thing. I, mean, I think most performers enjoy um, playing with their voice, whether or not that's um, singing, doing scales, whether or not that's making sounds like, a, you know, being a bear one minute and being a mouse the next. But um, <laughs> I, uh, so I always used to yeah do a lot of singing in the bathroom, making strange sounds and like bouncing my voice off the walls and uh and I, I kind of had a feeling that I would probably try and do something with that in the future um I went to drama school I went to the London School of Musical Theatre for a year mm-hmm. which was a kind of diploma course um and that was amazing because it gave me a real grounding it, it really built my uh, stamina up my vocal stamina uh mm-hmm. and it, I think it gave my diaphragm an awful lot of a lot of core strength and it uh, it taught me a lot about um about you know dealing with uh, with, with rejection and dealing with <laughs> how you know how to how to cope with being told no 500 times and whether or not you're doing something right or not right um and then i i did a show called the buddy holly story um with uh, with dan graham and uh, and another guy called chris reed and we worked together for uh, for about a year and a half, two years doing that show, and that kind of, that was the beginning really of a of a of a kind of future career doing um, rock and roll shows, and that's pretty much what I've built my career on. But alongside that, I've always managed to maintain a, a voiceover career. Um, I met a guy called Jonathan Kidd, who's one of the the kind of the stalwarts of the voiceover industry. He's a, a real, I mean, he's a he's a, got an incredible voice. He was actually the uh, the guy. I mean, it's probably a bit uh, a bit long ago now for for any of um, any of these listeners, but uh, he did a a voiceover for um, Ferrero Rocher. Uh, oh, wow. And uh, the advert was called the Ambassadors Selection, and he pretty much built his career off the back of uh, of that one voiceover. Um, and I met him uh, through a weird project that he was putting together, and I uh, I kept putting my voice reel on his desk, desperately trying to get him to listen to it at some point. Yeah. And he would always, every week I'd go back for another rehearsal and he'd have completely forgotten that I'd put it in there. <laughs> so I would just, at the end of the rehearsal, I'd sort of wander into the kitchen and just slowly pull it out from under a big wad of uh, of paperwork that he'd you know, slung on top of it and eventually got him to listen to it. And the very next day he sent it to his agent, who I'm still with today and have always been with the same agent um, another oh, time. Wow. Yeah, and uh, they said, yeah, this is great. We like it. Uh, why don't you come in for a, a test read? Did a test read? And um, uh, two hours later, it was it was a long, long old session, but it was really, really good fun. And um, they offered me a, a spot on their books, and uh, I've just never looked back. They've been they've been absolutely fantastic for me, and we've built such a, a great relationship. Uh, and I've I've managed to do some really fun jobs along the way. That sounds great. 
Awesome. Okay. So, um, you mentioned that you went to LSMT mm-hmm. for a year. Mm-hmm. How did that prepare you for going into the industry? So I always think of, when, whenever I think of what I do for a living, my career, if you like, I always think of it kind of separated into two two strands. Um so my well, only because only because uh, the the rock and roll show that I um, I run and, uh, and and perform in with uh, with Dan and Chris, um, that's something that's kind of a you know that's a, a very different side uh, of my creativity to my voiceover career, and um, I think that LSMT was an, an amazing way of uh, of, of coming of, of getting to grips with live performance and. There's a lot of crossover with live performance and studio work. Uh, obviously, I think it's important to take a similar energy with you wherever you go. You know, any time that you're you're switched on for work, any time that you tell yourself you're going into the, the the recording booth or you're walking onto stage, it's the same preparation you have to do mentally, and um, and the, the the professionalism that you carry with you everywhere. You know whether or not you at home you like slobbing out leaving Weetabix strewn across the living room is one thing but then the minute you get to work and the minute that you are with your um you know with your colleagues it's important i always think to uh to to kind of show your your best um and to and to act with you know a real i think the professionalism thing is such an important you know part of your integrity as as a performer in any uh in any capacity um so LSMT really prepared me in that sense. It gave me, it, I, I really under, I really had to understand, you know, when you prepare for an audition, when you go for a job, any kind of job, uh, they drilled it into you. And I think any good drama school does the same. They drilled it into you that preparation is the most important part. And, you know, when, when you're learning script after script and song after song for a new job, for a new audition that might potentially not even lead past a, a first recall or even a recall, then it, it, it gets really wearing and you you feel so dejected sometimes and, and it's it's easy to to lose it's really easy to lose hope. But you know, if you just don't know what ne- what the next opportunity is. And uh and if and if you really want, you know, if you really want to build this performing in whatever capacity as a career, it's so important to to maintain that focus and to maintain that that positivity and to every time you know you pick yourself up and and you're on to the next job no absolutely i think it's it's something that we try and speak to the students a lot about is this idea of you know a no will happen more than a yes will but that doesn't mean you're not going to work yeah and it spirals as well doesn't it you know sometimes sometimes all it takes for for someone is, is one yes and that could potentially be 10 years worth of work exactly you know it's it, you know a recurring gig that you might find yourself on or a, a particular theater director that really loves you and just wants to keep on using you you know i mean i've i've worked over the past 10 years i've worked for you know from everyone from the national theater through to rep companies out in the sticks and and you know if you make an impact with a a company or with a director or with a producer they're going to want to use you again and again because they've got so much else that they're thinking about you know there's so much stress when it comes to producing a piece or producing a, a theater show you know the, the the last thing you want is is any added stress from your <laughs> from your performers from the you know from the guys that you just want to solve problems mm. and i think as an as an artist as a performer as a creative when you when you walk into a room you know if you can solve the director's problem or the the producer's problem instantly by knowing the material they've sent you by you know going into the audition maybe dressed with a sort of slight hint of you know of the character and I really do think that's important Mm. I used to think that it was absolutely irrelevant but I think more and more nowadays people expect to see the character walk into the room Um, you know and I've heard loads of stories about people wandering in and doing the the accent of the person that they're supposed to be portraying before they've even met the uh, the director um, and it's you know it, it sounds bonkers but but people people get work like that and taking those kind of big risks and even if it ends up falling disastrously apart and halfway through the interview you know you go from being I don't know like a Scottish bloke or whatever <laughs> and then you, you end up sort of like stumbling into English and the director says what's going on what what was that and you're like oh I'm sorry I'm not Scottish really you know you never know that could be the beginning of a, of a great joke and that might end to a, that might end up in it with a with a really nice relationship and a, and a camaraderie it won't always work <laughs> like that but but in the good times it does you never know you got you have to take those risks so then how did you I know you kind of mentioned that um you worked through someone else how did you actually once you'd got your agent 
um, get into doing jobs with voiceover then? It's with voiceovers, I, there's a lot of companies out there. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of internet, I don't know what they're called, a lot of uh, opportunities, mm. I think, let's say, online to find your own work. And I think now it's obviously now more than ever, it's really, really easy for, for potential uh, creatives and producers to try and get hold of the talent online. And so people will get in, um, that's that's a very voiceover expression, by the way, <laughs> the talent, they will call you the talent. It won't, you won't feel like that sometimes when you walk in, but they will say, right, the talent has arrived. And it, it feels very weird, but um, it's quite nice after a while. You sort of think, yeah, yeah. Why doesn't yeah. everyone call me that? Come on. I'll be the talent. Um, but yeah, w- there's lots and lots of opportunities online. And I think you have to be careful sometimes with what you see as an opportunity and what is an opportunity and what is actually someone just trying to get you to work for, for free, essentially, or, or trying to take advantage. Mm-hmm. And I've always been very lucky because I've never, I, I have never, as a almost as a sign of respect, but also just because I, I believe it's the way to do things, I've not worked through any of these kind of online companies I've always just relied on my agent to find me the work and and even if people yeah. approach me uh, as an individual outside of uh, outside of the voiceover agent you know and they say oh you know could you just do this one as a little aside you know unless it's a, a very small project for a friend I will always cut my agent in and I will always say look I'm doing this project you know obviously this is going to go through you guys I'm going to put them in touch with you just because I think building that mutual mm. respect between you and your your agent who is is putting themselves out there for you on a on a daily basis if they're any good my agent has always been the one that's let me know if there's a job going and the thing with voiceovers that's really bonkers is if if it goes well with with your agent then unlike an awful lot of other uh avenues as a as a performer you don't really audition very much. Your voice reel is kind of your gateway to the to the world, and uh, oh, yeah, wow. and for the for the world to be let in to see what you can do. And so you don't really ever audition. Your voiceover agent will put out your reel. You'll have maybe five or six different reels. Maybe one if you're particularly good with accents, or if you're particularly good with you know sort of sultry, husky tones. Then they, they might concentrate on an, on a voice reel that that really brings out that uh, element of your voice. And uh, your agent will submit one of those reels for the project, depending on what they think fits the bill best. And then you basically, you just get a phone call saying, right, you've got a voiceover next Tuesday at uh, Gramercy Park Studios in Soho. It's going to be at two o'clock. You're going to meet Joe Bloggs. And um, they never give you the script either, or very rarely. So you turn up most of the time with a, a professional voiceover like that, in, in you know, the, especially the ones that you, you do in swanky uh, Soho studios. You're pretty much always cold. You're always reading cold. And um, it's very, it, that that's a real skill to acquire. Um, and I think the only way to do that is is just practice and and confidence. So it's, mm-hmm. it's very odd when you're given a script. Imagine doing an, um, a an audition for a, a theatre show and someone just gives you the song you know as you walk into the room it's 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 oh mad God, yeah it's absolutely horrendous. bonkers uh, obviously it's not the same as having to learn an entire song and you you do get the the script in front of you but you're expected to make that the words on that page come to life and sound entirely natural as if they have not been read from a page and being able to do that is something that it just it just takes time it just takes time and practice um and you know you can nowadays it's great because you can just record yourself at home you can practice over and over again um and Mm. and the the most important thing is definitely your reel get get your get a get a really really solid voice reel my greatest advice (laughs) would would definitely be for voiceover work specifically is your reel is your it it will be your your greatest friend It, it it's it you know you have to respect how important it is because it's the only thing that you're sending out to, to absolutely represent. everyone and whether or not you're yeah whether or not you're trying to get an agent whether or not you're trying to get people to hear you um you know producers creatives anyone anyone that's putting a project together it's absolutely vital that you you show your 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 best you know you you showcase the best of your voice and uh, and that's not necessarily always what you think it is either you know i i um a lot of the time, I you know, I always really want to do accent mm. work because I absolutely love I, I love playing with accents and I, I find it absolutely fascinating that um, 
you know that you can that you can be from i don't know newcastle one morning and then you can head through wales and then over to south africa i mean i've 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 done voiceovers in all sorts of different accents in the past but without fail the most by far the most core uh, the most common call for my my voice is, is literally just myself and i would have thought that would be the same for for most of uh, of, of your guys as well people just because there's so much option out there you know if they want someone who's scottish they'll just go and find someone who's scottish if they want someone south african etc so find some find find out you know what what really uh what really suits your voice the timbre of your voice the the tone the 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 color the texture of your voice and really really take the time to listen to it and and think about what your voice Mm. could sell because you know there's there's certain voices that sell certain products i mean it wouldn't make any sense for me to be on here selling like a a latest you know grime mm. album um, god i couldn't imagine it just that. you know it, yeah exactly there you go and if you can't imagine it then no one else can imagine it so you you have to be very realistic with yourself about what your voice is going to sell and it it is just the most wonderfully diverse colorful world out there that you are that that you can go and you know that you can go and use your voice in and everyone will find a place and everyone literally there is there is a a call or a cause or a need for every single person's voice out there and and nowadays more than ever i would say that there's a real call for like reality you know for real Mm. voices that's i always hear that when um you know when people put the the call out for for projects is that you know they they don't want a, a kind of manicured like, you know very posh rp accent so i'm a bit stuffed but um <laughs> they uh, you know more often than not nowadays that you know they just want something very rootsy very earthy very real you know some a lot of kind of a lot of northern accents mm. are very uh a, a very um, inviting and are seen to be very um what's the word very uh comforting um and uh yeah it, it's 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 strange when you when you realize that that you your voice will not be able to sell everything just categorically it won't <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of almost i guess you're not limited in the work that you do but you have to be very kind of not necessarily picky but you have to be aware of what it is that you're going to be best at doing yeah exactly i think realistic yeah, yeah definitely it's it's like you know it's like for a for a theater show or for a a, a project you know i um I absolutely love you know Death of a Salesman. Mm. It's I think it's my favourite play of all time, Arthur Miller, and I think it's it's just the most incredible, incredible piece. And when I was at school, when I was sixteen years old, I remember I played uh, Willie Loman in uh, in Death of a Salesman, <laughs> and having a sixteen year old play a guy who's going through a midlife crisis, um, on the verge of seeing his world crumble around him, but not really understanding it and dealing with his sons who he can't work out whether or not he feels like they're failures whether or not they're successes whether or not they're lying to him mm. you know all of these things these these are a whole load of emotions that i would never have been able to imagine when i was 16 years old and in you know in reality i should you know no one i sh- I, I can't play that part it's not it's not for me but but knowing that that's not for me is is you know half the job yeah. and i love it and i'd love to be able to do it but i've got to wait another 40 years to be able to do that <laughs> And it's the same thing with voiceover work. You know, you can't, as much as you can strain your voice to sound like something else, and I do, <laughs> as much as you strain your voice to sound like someone else or like something else, there's just something so exposing about a voiceover microphone, about the, the personal relationship that you have with the microphone and, the, and when it hits those speakers and comes back to mm. you, that is so exposing and so true and honest that you... you are forced into being yourself you you almost have to and and any lie any lie the the microphone because they're you know, great microphones in these uh, in these recording studios they'll they'll hear it and they'll pick it up and the producer will hear it and they'll pick it up and the audience will hear it and they'll pick <laughs> it up and then suddenly it all falls apart oh god that would just be horrendous to kind of be in that situation yeah but it's like yeah just being being truthful i think is what i'm saying yeah. with your with your voice that's a really good piece of advice thank you so what kind of voiceovers then do you tend to kind of get picked up for if you're if we're talking about that kind of true voice idea Mm. well i very recently i my voiceover agent because i am quite a small fry in uh, in a big a big pond 
with their with their books so they have all sorts of uh, of, of really great artists on their uh, voiceover books they've got people like jason isaacs oh wow and uh yeah and mark strong as well um and caroline quentin <laughs> and mark heap um just lots of lots of really really kind of very cool people and lots of really big names mm. i i tend to get i sort of tend to do a lot of um a lot of the smaller, a lot of the smaller stuff. So, you know, you would never have me sort of doing a read for Jaguar <laughs> saying, check out the new Jaguar. You know, it just doesn't <laughs> ring true. I don't have that gravity. You know, I am not Mark Strong. You know, it's like you, you need the right person for the yeah. right job. So I, I've i done a lot of really fun stuff. I've done um, I've done campaigns for FIFA where uh, where I had to be a, a make noises, make, make like fox noises because <laughs> this the mascot for uh, for one of the FIFA World Cups was a was a fox. Uh, and um, I, I think it's for FIFA. I think it might be for a, a Russian, like a Russian FIFA computer game. It was something like that. It was something <laughs> like that. And uh, and I remember having to like head a ball as a fox and uh, and do a slide tackle as a fox. And I remember the, uh, vividly the first the first comment they or the first instruction they gave me was uh, right. We'd uh, well, thanks very much for coming in. Um, we'd like to start with some light panting. <laughs> And I just remember thinking that was the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. No, you know, no one's ever said to me, <laughs> we'd like to start with some light panting. And uh, yeah, I've now got that framed in, uh, <laughs> in my downstairs bathroom. No, I don't really. But yeah, um, I've done all sorts of really diverse stuff. And I do a lot of musical stuff as well. Um, things that require a bit of musicality. Yeah. So I just did a voiceover for Amex. And uh, that was a, a, almost like a poem that I was reading. So it had it had meter, it had rhythm, it had uh, a slight tonality to it, but it was still my own voice. You know, there was no, um, there, there was no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sort of putting on a voice, if you like. Yeah. I was just, I, I was just, um, you know, I was using the musicality in my voice. Uh, so I did an Amex thing, which was a poem. And is it with that, is it important to really have a good understanding of meter and rhythm then to be able to kind of do things like that? Kind of on the, as you say, quite cold. Yeah, I, I feel like I personally think that musicality and, and my sense of musicality has been a, a huge, huge part of my voiceover career. I think when you listen, th there's a... I, I hear everything as a, a song, really. I, I hear not everything. That sounds, that sounds very dramatic, <laughs> doesn't it? Can you imagine? I was like living in a Disney film. <laughs> no, I hear, I, but I, I hear when I listen to an advert or something. If I listen to a, a Curry's PC World advert, I don't hear someone saying, um, "Now at Curry's PC World." We've got brand new laptops, just three nine nine. What I hear is now at Curry's, we've got brand new laptops, just three nine nine. And, and I hear that as a, I hear that as as a, a, as a sound. I hear that as a, yeah, exactly. I don't hear that as words trying to sell a product. And being able to connect the words with the musicality is the point. And you know, anyone that studies musical theatre or anyone that studies theatre or music, you know, individually understands the potency mm. of that. You know, and and if you are able to connect the musicality with with the intention of the words, then that's where that that's where the success comes. I think that's really cool. And yeah, I I guess it is just kind of a lot of kind of internal thoughts about you know color, uh, tone, and and pitch and things like that. And I guess you probably get quite used to just exploring it without even thinking oh i'm gonna you know ra raise my pitch here and i'm gonna make this into a question or i'm gonna do this or that yeah you don't yeah exactly you don't i, I i've never been through well rarely re i've very rarely been through a, a voiceover script because you don't have time most of the time mm. but I, i've not been through a script with a fine tooth comb and worked out where i'm going to put the peaks and the troughs and the the the, the kind of the you know the, the heavy glottal stops mm. or it just comes naturally and it, it, i think when you when you speak to the producers and when they make their intentions clear with the project and when you see make, often you have a screen in front of you as well which gives you the visuals for the advert yeah. that you're going to be um, reading for then it becomes really apparent very quickly that the kind of the, the color the tone that you need to adopt mm. and like I was saying about Jaguar and about doing an advert for Jaguar, you'd never go in for a Jaguar advert and say, we've got brand new Jaguar cars. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it, there's a certain sort of implied, there's a very implicit um, tone that comes with certain brands yeah. and certain products. And also one thing that I find so funny at the moment is almost every advert that you hear for uh, any kind of um, 
what they call like insurance or, or banks or anything, there's always a ukulele in it. <laughs> and it just, it drives me absolutely bonkers. You're like, come on, who decided the sound for an advert for a, an insurance company <laughs> Or a bank should have a ukulele. I don't know who did, but they did. And now everyone does it. It's crazy. It's a universal thing now. <laughs> it really is. It really is. The hardest ones are when you uh, when you go in and, and you have to read what they call uh, what they call wild. So if you read if you do wild reads, that means that they give you a script and you don't have any music. You, they don't. They won't cue you in. They won't give you. Um, they won't give you any visuals to work from. You'll probably get, you know, a bit of chat from the producer or from the creative on the project, uh, but you, you you'll be kind of left in the dark. And then the the light will go red. You'll get a little light, um, a little kind of you know uh, record light button yeah. in front of you, and there's no sound. And your cans go absolutely dead because they've <laughs> cut they've cut the feed from next door. And it's just you and you're in your own little world. Your voice is ringing around your head because obviously you've got it you know, cranked up nice and loud yeah. in your cans and you're reading from a script. And I think some people obviously would find that very scary or intimidating because you're you're reading wild, which means that, that there's nothing else. It's just your voice. But I, I, I love it. I absolutely love that moment that, ev- that the whole world goes silent and then they, they press record and you hear just crystal crystal clear every single bit of you know every bit of saliva that is attached to the inside (laughs) of your mouth i know it sounds grim but it's so true you know it's just it's so so pristine the Mm. the way that they capture your voice um you you have like like i was saying earlier you know you've got nowhere to hide uh and that that's where i kind of feel most free because you 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 know you're, you're you're not trying to follow anything or anyone else you're you know you're just you're just reading and uh, or you're just, you know, voiceovering, as it were, because like I say, you, you don't want it to sound like you're reading. No. But that that's fun is the you know reading wild. Do you think uh, one of the units that our students study is developing voice for the actor? Um, and it's meant to be to cover live performance and recorded performance. Things they have to learn about is vocal anatomy um, mm. and how the voice works and the ways in which you can manipulate the voice in that way. Um, did you have to kind of have a, a good knowledge of any of that or is that just kind of a, a byproduct of training and then you kind of move on and just use all these tools without even realising it, I guess? I, I think that it is important to have a grounding and it's important to f- practice your techniques, you know, whatever they may be and whoever you work with or whoever you train with, you know, all advice is, uh, is advice. Uh, I would say that just allowing yourself to be in the moment and allowing yourself to feel free when you mm. are when you're in that creative space is is more important than um focusing on on all the, the technique technical. that you've that you've worked on but you know that stuff you should have done already and that that stuff should just be within you and that stuff should you know you you got you got to let it go you have to let it go and I, i've been in shows before where i have caned myself and i've really given myself a hard time about like you know, there's been one high note in a show and and it's ruined my entire perf- no, not performance but it's really you know, it's ruined the night for me because i'm worried so much about that one note and mm. i get to it and i put all of the technique in place and i think oh squeeze and think down and look up and uh, jump around or any of it just don't <laughs> make this note crack please um but you know the more you do that the more your voice goes oh and then that's it. Yeah, because you, your whole you, body freezes, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, the night that you think, oh, I forgot, I forgot to worry about that note. You know, it just <laughs> happened 10 minutes ago. And I think that's the same, if not more, even more true with voiceover, is that you you, you really need to, uh, as I was saying about being exposed, you really need to let your, your voice sound as natural as possible and, and sound as free as as possible and what you know whether or not you've got a voice that is like you've got really high register or whatever it's the same thing you 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 just let your voice be what your voice is going to be because the reason someone's hired you is they want they want your voice they don't want you know gary next door or linda next door they want they want your voice and uh and so you just got to give it to them in in as you know as pure pure form as you can you mentioned earlier about um when you get into the room what you'd kind of uh, you see in terms of like visual does does the visual really help 
that much with the the vocal choice. Yeah, of course. The the moment that you get the phone call from your agent saying this is the voiceover and it's going to be for this client and it's going to be at this location, your brain starts to go to work right right from then. Mm. Um, and whether or not you see that the client is, um, I don't know, the cl- the client's Coca Cola. So I did a voiceover for Coca Cola uh, about a year, no, about two years ago now, and it was for a big winter campaign that they were doing, a big a Christmas campaign even that they were doing, mm. and it was about uh, about car keys on the uh, on the. Um, it was about handing over your bar, your car keys to the bar staff at Christmas, which meant that you in turn then got a free Coke. And I remember seeing that the uh, the advert was going to be for Coca Cola, and uh, being the sort of shameless capitalist that I am, <laughs> I, uh, I, I I thought, wow, that's you know that's that's pretty cool. Like that's you know some you know when I was a kid, if someone said you're going to be doing voiceover for like a big campaign for for Coca Cola, I'd have thought, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And the moment I saw it was for Coca Cola, I had uh you know had the jitters I'm like okay all right okay i've done a lot of i've done a lot of campaigns by this point and i've worked for a lot of different companies and a lot of people every, you know, big scale stuff small scale stuff like reads that last for hours doing you know, <laughs> like books and doing you know all sorts of uh, like singing jobs and stuff but i hadn't done anything for coca-cola and i remember seeing it come in and thinking okay okay all right oh, this is gonna, this is gonna be fun and then um I, you know, I couldn't prepare for it didn't get the script obviously you can ask for the script but it's not normally forthcoming the reason yeah. being adverts happen so quickly the turnover on them happens incredibly quickly you've probably noticed already online at, on uh, on tv you're seeing adverts for you know uh, brands that have put stuff out since the lockdown yeah. Um, you know, for oh, all you enterprising companies out there, you know, with the circumstances as they are, blah, blah, blah. We want you to know that we're on your side. Try Intuit books, all that kind of stuff. You know, th- they move fast and they have to move fast because that's how they that's how they make money. Yeah. So the scripts can be literally changed. I mean, most of the scripts are changed as you're doing the voiceover. It, it's oh, that wow. it's that bonkers. They will they'll <laughs> they'll flip words around. They'll get something to, to to sit better in your voice. They'll they'll try and make something work better when they hear it out loud. Mm. Um, but you get the call. You know, you're doing a voiceover for Coca Cola. Then you walk into the studio. You know, turn up to the building. It's always really intimidating because it's always a really swanky studio. Um, it's like you know, it, you feel like you're sort of walking into I don't know if any if you know Mad Men, the set of Mad Men, like everything's yeah. been every, everything's been interior designed to within a, a, a an inch, um, to within an inch of its life, and it's it's really nice. And then there's always some incredibly great looking receptionist who says, "Hi, welcome to the studio." And you think, "Oh my god, oh my god!" <laughs> and then you know you you wander through and you sit on this plush leather sofa or whatever it is. You know you go through, you meet the pretty, you meet you meet the creative team in the in the engineering. Uh, studio so that's always connected to the booth with a Mm. you know kind of a nice screen well you hope it is with a nice glass screen and with coke there were uh, i think there were eight of them um, and then there was a ninth person who kept flitting backwards and forwards as well you know there's normally a runner who gets everyone lunch um, you've always got a couple of script writers, you've got a producer, maybe three producers, four producers I've seen on some projects. Oh, you've wow. got the director. Yeah, it, it can get really, really crammed in that uh, in that booth. Um, sorry, in the, in the studio. Um, you've got an engineer who's always like the coolest person you've ever met, who's just really <laughs> laid back and sort of says, oh man, this is bonkers. They've been at this since three o'clock last night. And then, you know, you kind of click with the engineer because they're always on your side. They just want you to get the job done like as easily as possible because obviously yeah. they don't want to be editing till four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, and so you kind of meet that, meet the entire team. If there's enough of them, you don't bother shaking hands because there's just so many of them. And then they're like, right, okay, here's the script. And you're like, okay, haven't seen that before. Okay, it's four pages long. Okay, great, 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 great. Let's give it a go. Yeah, we've got an hour. Great, okay. And then they plonk you in the booth. You know, the engineer will kind of say, have you got everything you need? Have you got your, have you got your glass of water? Have you got sharp pencils just in case you need to make amendments to the notes? They check your level with you. So you do a bit of a read. And that's kind of your, that's that that's really golden time because you're playing with your voice, you're warming yourself up. You know, you've been on the tube, you've woken up really mm. early to get to this voiceover, all that stuff. You probably yeah. haven't been able to make too much noise. So <clears throat> that, that play time that you have when they're doing the test read with you or when they're doing the sound check, the level check is really, really good because you can... You can play, you know, you can you can shout, you can scream, you can 
and, and and you know do take that opportunity to to make noise because the whole point is that they're trying to gauge where your voice sits with the microphone the engineer mm-hmm. will be making all sorts of tweaks and uh, amendments to the eq on your voice and that you know they can do a lot of that in post-production but they try and get a lot of it done beforehand and you uh yeah, so you you go into the booth and then you know the the producer sort of says, okay, right, let's you know let's have a uh, let's have a read. So, so the, you're um, you're you're just you know you're a 32 year old guy. Uh, obviously, you're 32 anyway, so that's perfect. There we go. You're walking into a bar and uh, you you know you, the bar staff needs this. Blah blah blah. They'll give you a little bit of information about the campaign. They'll say maybe this is going out to six territories. It's going to America. It's going to I don't know Bahrain and uh, <laughs> Indonesia and all over the UK. Okay, it's going to get you know whatever 30 million listens whatever because they often have that stuff lined up and arranged yeah. in advance um and you know just more stuff to pile on the pressure basically and uh yeah as and then do. exactly as you do and then that's it and then you know as i was saying earlier it, it, the line goes cold your the, the cans feel very warm feels very noisy and and you start with your read and you never expect it to be perfect the first take and a lot of the time they will take your first take. they will use your first take uh it's just relaxed it's just relaxed because you're you're so you're so focused in a way you know you're you're so sort of on edge that actually what comes out of your mouth because your brain's working so hard what comes out of your mouth is is the most natural take you'll do and then yeah. from there on you know you'll you'll overthink everything um that's what always happens with me anyway. I'm sure it's different <laughs> with everyone. Um, and then, the, you know, the voiceover takes as long as it takes. And there's never really a moment where they go, yep, that's the one. We got that one. We got that one. <laughs> because they'll want a few different takes to go home with and play around with. And, you know, yeah. th- their job has only just begun, really, when when they get your voice. Because they're going to be there for hours after you've left. Um, and like I say, they'll never refer to you really by name. It'll always be the talent, uh, especially if there's a lot of people in there because they've mm. probably got five other voices that they're working with that morning. And uh, yeah. Have you spoken to you about any of this? And it's really kind of, yeah, I don't know. I, I knew that you did voiceovers and I knew that you worked on you know some really good stuff, but it's really interesting to to kind of hear you paint a picture of it. It's, it's a different yeah. world in there. It really is a different world. The moment you walk into the the offices themselves, and there's some really, really beautiful ones in Soho, mm. places you would you would never know about them. Um, as soon as you walk through the door, you, you go, okay, right, oh, here we go. And the, <laughs> I, honestly, it's like some of the places they've got. Um, one of my favourites is uh, is in Soho. It's called GPS, and it's Gramercy Park. I think I mentioned it. I think I mentioned mm. it before, but it's they've got a uh, a full on coffee like a like a barista style coffee shop but just for the people who work in in that building or just oh, just wow. for the people who work in that particular office and uh like they, they have this menu like this coffee menu that is it's, it's incredible <laughs> it's absolutely incredible and they ask you you know they've got a lunch menu as well so you can just order something from any of the nearby swanky restaurants as you know oh. for a bit of lunch um it's not always like that. It's obviously it's not always <laughs> like that. But on on a long on a long voice, you know, on a long um, project, then yeah. then they'll they'll normally always sort of sort you out with some kind of lunch, and you and you just feel really looked after. Yeah, it can do. Yep, 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 yep. So I've I've had jobs that you know that obviously your job is to get it done as quickly as possible yeah. because time is very much money. I'd say almost more than any other discipline except maybe oh, wow. filmmaking. Uh, time is money. That so I'm I'm describing these studios as swanky. That's because they are swanky. That's because the the uh, the companies are paying an arm and a leg for an hour of studio time there. And it's because they've got the best engineers. They've got the best gear. They've got you know soundproofing in the centre of London, which is <laughs> unheard of really. Um, you know, think about the lengths you have to go to to not hear the tube <laughs> rumbling through your studio. Well, yeah. And, uh, they uh yeah they they they're beautiful studios so the 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 guys who are creating the project or the you know the producers they are really they are constantly constantly in the back of their minds they've got this little ticking clock and yeah. uh and every single time that the uh that the hand on the clock moves another pound goes past wow. and it it's really <laughs> like that it really is like that and you shouldn't be thinking about that as a voiceover artist you know your job is to go in there and and, and deliver creatively but just knowing that 
and having that information and knowing that someone else, the company, are paying an arm and a leg for it means that, you know, when you want to stick around before the voiceover and talk about the fact that, you know, you, you put blueberries in your porridge that morning, it's just another thing. You have to be hyper aware of the fact that everything's on a time, everything's on a very, very tight time uh, schedule uh, on a t- you know on a what's the word yeah on, on a schedule yeah, on everything's a schedule. on a schedule and you you have to be very sensitive to that so th- there might be someone in the room that wants to chat with you about what you do like then you look you know you, you you're chatting with that person and you know it's great because you're because they're really into music but then you see mm. there's three other people sat in the studio who are all looking at their watches thinking right we're not paying this guy to hear his life story you know <laughs> we want the job and you have to be very, very sensitive to that because that will happen an awful lot. Like that will yeah. really happen a lot. The engineers never do it. The engineers are great. You know, they always say, oh, good morning. How you doing? Lovely. Booth's all set up for you. Do you want to go on through? That, that is literally what you'll get from an engineer. And that is everything you need. But with producers, because obviously they want to know a bit about you. They've hired you. You're their mm. creative. You know, you're, um, you're their talent, etc. They get really excited. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just grunt at you and go, yeah, that was all right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's really important to know that you are. It, it's costing someone an awful lot of money to have you there. So you you know ju- just 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 do your job. Just yeah. do your job, and you'll be absolutely fine. It's that simple. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, is there a? Have you ever had an experience where you're working in a booth with another actor? Does that is that something that you come across at all, or is it always just solo work? No, across the across the years, I've uh, worked with lots of other actors, um, and I've done I've done uh, voiceovers from uh, I've done voiceovers from all over the place. So sometimes you'll be in a, a studio somewhere, uh, and you'll have another guy's voice uh, a, a thousand miles away. The main guy, the main voice for it was this. Uh, he's, a, he's an American comedian. I can't remember his name, which I'm really embarrassed about. But anyway, he's an American <laughs> comedian, and uh, and his his part was uh, we were recording at the same time, but he was in America, so he I think he was over in New York, and he was in a studio there, and I was in a studio oh, wow. in London, and we were literally just bouncing off each other. You know, we we were doing the voiceover together, and. Uh, and and it's just, it's just crazy like you know that that it felt live it felt like he was in the room i could hear his voice in my cans I, you know i couldn't see him at all but you don't need you know you don't necessarily need to um they've a lot of studios have got what's called an isdn line which is kind of a high speed connection yeah. um which i think doesn't use the internet which means that it doesn't ever get clogged up um so a lot of studios have got one of those as well as obviously very very strong um strong internet uh and it is uh, you. You know, you sometimes you're in a booth with with five other people, and your part in it is is literally just two words. I mean, I've I've genuinely done a voiceover where I, I said three words, oh, wow. um, and and that's it. You know, that you go in, you still get paid your studio fee. So that that's how that works. By the way, you mm. get you get paid a studio fee, and you know, depending on who you are, your hourly studio rate will uh, will be very different. I mean, I'm guessing, I'm just guessing here that my hourly studio rate is slightly different to Mark Strong's. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, obviously. We could well be on the same basic studio fee. It's called a BSF, but uh, I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> and quite rightly so, but there we go. Um, that, yeah, you, um, you'll go, yeah, you'll, you'll do an hour long session. And like I say, you might, you might be part of a, you know, a, a chorus of eight people and you've got two words in this thing. But, you know, man, you better get those two words right and you better <laughs> say them at the right time. Um, so I've worked, yeah, I've worked in, in in a booth with lots of other people. I actually, funnily enough, I, I, I don't enjoy it as much, uh, oh, weirdly. Really? Yeah, I, and I think it's because it adds just a little layer of level of stress, not to you, but to the, uh, to the guys the other side to of the, the screen. Room. Uh, yeah, to, to the producers and the, and, the, and the creatives and the script writers. And it's, it's, it's that unknown entity. So you don't know what's going to come out of the other people's mouths. Mm. And if they get something wrong or if they keep stumbling over a certain part or if they are nervous or if they're over-energized or whatever, you can't do anything about that. And yet the people in the other room are getting slightly more worn down every time that happens. 
yeah. and sometimes it's you you know I'm not, I'm not saying it's always it's, it's always someone else who's who's messing it up and and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking come on come on let's get on with it you know sometimes <laughs> it's you're that person but again like the last thing you want is to feel like four other people looking at you going oh why can't he just say you know the well, caterpillar yeah. had a big cat or whatever it, it's 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 sometimes it you you kind of get in a rut with a certain with a certain sentence and you just have to shake that off straight away you just have to let that go because I've heard people get stuck with a certain sentence and you know they can't read it in a different way you know they're being asked to do something seven different ways and when you're sat you know two meters away from someone or a meter away from someone who's really struggling with a line there's there's nothing like less inspiring for your your next your next read um so it I've yeah I find it stressful so how do you keep that going then how do you kind of deal with that as the person who is not the one making the mistake what's you know do you have to kind of regroup yourself as well or is it you know you just kind of get on with it from there yeah as always as I well I I have found personally that staying out of the way of everyone in a voiceover in in that scenario is as important Mm. as knowing when to to pipe up um (laughs) so you will often get the script writers uh, making amendments quite quite frantically as you're as you're going and you can you might hear what what needs to be said you might hear what Mm. needs to be put forward you might hear a different musicality or a different a different way of reading it um but unless it's really obvious that your input is welcome i would always always stay well clear of that because there are people paid plenty of money to worry (laughs) about that that's not your job to worry about your job to worry about is is using your instrument and delivering delivering your voice on call and uh and you just concentrate on that because i've been in a lot of situations where you know i've i've wanted to make a suggestion or i've i've heard how i think something could be improved or or helped upon but you know these big companies like bbh like bartle bogart and hegarty they're one of the biggest advertising companies in the country you know they're quite capable of finding script writers to do that job you know <laughs> and uh that, quite frankly they, they don't need your input so i think i think having that humility sometimes is a, is a real virtue as well nice um is there a particular way that you work with a director in the booth whether it's on your own or with or with other people every director is different like any like any other any mm. other creative pursuit is it a similar kind of feel to working live or sometimes sometimes you get I've been very lucky. I've done a, a couple of cartoons. Uh, <laughs> I've done some cartoon stuff with uh, with some great. You you often get great directors with the cartoon stuff, and I think it's because you need to well to do it to want to do it in the first place. You have to be playful, very playful as a director to want to work with cartoons. So you often find that that bears itself out in uh, that's borne out in 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 the way that they direct. Yeah, and. Um, but yeah, the the medium, you know, you you. I don't think I don't think it works. You know, if you if you run it like a sort of military regime and you're trying to do an advert for Cartoon Network, it's not. You know, it's not really gonna. <laughs> it's it's not gonna ring true. No. Um. So I've I've had a lot of really really fun directors with with cartoon stuff where they are a lot more hands on with what they want. So they'll be, they'll be quite specific with you, and e- even sometimes, um. You you hear you you'll hear someone say you know I don't want to give you a read, and what that means is that uh, they are literally going to note by note, word for word, going to tell you how to speak a line. So you know if if the line is um, I'm going to sell you a brand new speaker, and you keep saying I'm going to sell you a brand new speaker, you know they they might want I'm going to sell you a brand new speaker. But they don't want to give you that. They don't want you to tell. They don't want to tell you that that's yeah. how you should. You know, you put, you should put the weight on that word. Um, but they they can sort of you know they can hint at it without actually having to read the line for you how they want it. Yeah. But w- with cartoon stuff, sometimes you do get a bit more of that. Sometimes you do get a bit more. No, it's got to be this. And 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 it's because mm. they understand they understand the intention of the cartoon and and they they have the visual in their mind almost more than you can because sometimes you're you know a lot of the time with a cartoon you're not working to a picture because they okay. then go and they animate to your voice so oh, wow. th- they will often give you yeah they they will often give you the read you know that they're after and they'll say no yeah. what's happening here is uh, he's tumbling down a hill you know at, at the end it has to tail off like this i can't believe we didn't go anywhere 
you know, and they'll they'll give you they'll give you that as a, as a, as a very specific direction. Yeah, but it's really fun work working with a, a creative director, uh, working with a director that that has vision and has worked in other mediums like theatre or film or TV makes a huge difference because you do sometimes come across creatives. Um, and, and I say that you know, in the kind of loosest sense that, uh, that that just have a script and, you know, they don't want to do it even. They, they, they don't really even want to, to be there in the booth. Mm. They just want to concentrate on writing and they'll just shove yeah. the script in front of you and go, oh, I've, I've done the hard work. Just read that. Come on. It's not <laughs> difficult. And that's not helpful. But, it, you know, another scenario that does happen. OK, well, we've only got two questions left for you now. So first one is three tips that you would give to an aspiring voiceover artist just kind of the three main things to do sure number one have a really really long hard look and listen to your own voice and be very honest with yourself about what your voice is capable of and what your voice most naturally inclines towards when it comes to what you might be able to sell or what sort of work you are you, you might be might be good for and whether or not that's because you have a really stretchy voice and you could be fantastic at doing wacky characters for promos and for uh, cartoons or whether or not you have an incredibly rich deep gravelly voice that can add impact and uh, and warmth and authority to a, to a very established brand. There's an awful lot of work out there and everybody is looking for an authentic sound. So find your authentic sound. That That's my number one. Awesome. Uh, number two is your reel is the most important, is the single most important, um, the, the single most important element uh, in your, like in, in your arsenal. Um, because it's all very well getting on the phone to people and saying, I'm a voiceover agent, please take me on. I can do, I can do, I can do everything. I can do lots of voices. Look, look how versatile I am. But there is nothing like the sound of your voice through a very high quality microphone in incredibly controlled kind of conditions in a very con controlled environment um, that will showcase exactly what your voice is capable of and once you've got that reel once you've got that 90 seconds of reel people will only ever listen to the first 30 30 seconds unless they're really interested in which case they might listen to a minute but that 90 seconds of your voice the first 10 seconds is just gold dust like that is what everyone will listen to because you know you've got to think clients uh voiceover agents producers all of these people they've got very little time they've got thousands of voices to listen to and they want to hear something in their head straight away that's going to shout at them that's what i need for my project invest in your voice reel find someone near nearby uh who or you know it doesn't have to be nearby but normally there is especially if you're in london there'll be loads of people around find a really good um studio or uh, someone offering services to create a voice reel and invest in it because it can, I have not changed my voice reel in ten years. Oh my, wow! My my main commercial reel. My voice is actually fairly similar. Obviously, I've done subsequent reels and I've done international voice reels. And I've, you know, having done a lot more work, I've I've now my my voice reel is pretty much entirely the commercial stuff I've done. But my voice agent still uses my wacky characters voice reel for pretty much everything that I do. And that was when I first joined <laughs> ten years ago. So your reel is the is definitely the most important thing. And number three, it's just it's just be yourself, be yourself in in a studio environment when you get the jobs and when the work starts coming because you've concentrated on on points number one and two, and when you are actually in the booth and when you're working with all these people, stay professional, mm -hmm. but don't forget to be yourself because your personality is like this is the single greatest thing that's going to sell you, and that's regardless of whether or not you're working a theatre job, whether or not you're working a, um, a a TV job, a film job, you know, even when you're acting another character. I remember, actually, I do remember my drama teacher once told me, you know, it doesn't matter how much you're acting, you are always going to be at least like 85% yourself. 
because you can't change all those things. You can't change your your body. You can't change your face. You can't change the way that you mm. sound. You know, you can manipulate those things and you can you can act with them and you can uh, you know you can you can you can create characters. But when people see you, if you're thinking like really coldly about it, when someone sees you, they see you. They don't see you yeah. doing a character. You know, they they see they see what you are and who you are and, and your voice. Um. So yeah, so be that and be you know be proud of that. Be 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 happy to be who you are, and that that confidence will uh, will come shining forth and will uh, will fill the studio. Uh, I know I said that in a slightly jokey way, but I really believe that. That's a really great piece of advice. Thank you very much. Um, and you actually answered my final question within your thing so that's kind of all the questions I have for you so thank you very much for joining us Ollie um it's been really really interesting especially I found it really interesting to hear what you have to say about all of this and I know that our students will really love it so thank you very much for coming on with us fantastic thank you well thanks very much for uh, for getting in touch it's been it has been really nice to chat and Good. best of luck to everyone out there um just keep keep positive keep smiling and uh yeah and work hard that's that's it that's it <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much we'll see you soon thanks guys bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.